well folks mel's back again this is the new year 2023 what a way to start off with mel my good old friend for many years we used to be together uh at speaker's corner before i left in 2017 we're now six years later and we're still going strong mel's coming up with all kinds of new things we in in the last year the last video that we put up we looked at this elevation of muhammad through the centuries how that evolves we're interested in history that's what mel and i do that's what the sin sifters do that's why we're sifting the sin as standard islamic narrative and we're sifting it and we're finding out that an awful lot of the standard islamic narrative a lot of the traditions that are have created islam as we see today when you put it through the sif you'll see that there's an awful lot of borrowing that much of this is not something that was came ex nihilo. The, the Quran did not come from an uncreated book in heaven. We've pretty much eradicated that idea. Muhammad himself probably didn't even exist. Uh, we pretty much eradicated that. Mecca, we know, didn't exist until the 8th century. Uh, so we've thrown those out. Now we're looking at some other things much more interesting. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look at a very controversial reference in the Quran, chapter 5, verse 116 which has always been a curiosity to me, to Mel, uh, to many others. I know uh, that many people, I know Hatu likes to confront it. I know David Wood likes to confront it. I confront it. I've always believed that this is a misnomer. What's it doing in the Quran? Why is it equating uh, Jesus and Mary as, to, as people to be worshipped? <clears throat> What's Mary doing there? why she part of the trinity and we've just assumed that ever evidently they got their wires crossed or they didn't understand uh, what christians were saying but i can't believe that people would be that idiotic or that that thick those who put the quran together to believe that mary would be the one that this is referring to now notice what i've just said is this mary the mother of jesus that this is referring to or is this something else i'm not going to tell you i'm not going to tell you Mel's going to tell you. And Mel has been doing some research. I'll let him introduce it. Uh, so a, a, a French scholar, Galez, who is one who has really unpacked this, a good friend of Odin Lafontaine, who's another one of our sin sifters. They are the ones that are introducing this. This is the first time I'm hearing it. I'm not, I purposely have not heard this yet. I've just got, he just gave me the introduction to it. So I'm going to get right over to Mel, let him unpack it. Let's see what you think. I'm going to be writing notes and see what I think and prior to come out with some type of conclusion. I may or may not agree with Mel. Maybe you don't either as well. Let's see what he has to say and let's see where his argument goes. Over to you, Mel. Okay, so before I share my slides, the key reason why people are misinterpreting this text and once I give you the correct interpretation. It's the penny's going to drop. It's going to make perfect sense. But the reason is because we have accepted the standard Islamic narrative, which says that all of this took place way down in the Hejaz. Now, what I'm going to argue is that if we put the context back in the Syriac region, the Fertile Crescent up in the north, we'll find that culturally this makes perfect sense. Um, so that's where that's where we're heading. Let me just share my slides with you. While he's up bringing the slides, for some of you who may be new to what Mel has just said, maybe some of you may not know the uh, the background, those of us who have been on both his channel, which is Origins, go look at his channel, I'll put the URL right here at the bottom, and on this channel, Fander Films, also on Sita International, we have taken and we have shown over the last two years, especially, that almost everything we know about Islam comes not from the Hijaz, not from Mecca and Medina, not from that central part of Arabia, but from much further north. In this case, in what is today Syria and Iraq, Lebanon and Israel, that area, much further north, that's where the people lived, that's where the towns were, that's where the civilizations were, and that's where these discussions, these theological discussions were taking place. Back to you, Mel. Okay, so this is Surah 5, 116. You, I'm sure we'll have seen it before. We'll read it through first. I'll make a few comments before we go further. So Isa, son of Mary, did you say to the people, take me and my mother for two divinities beside or apart from God? Now, the first thing I would start with is it's identifying who Isa is by the reference to son of Mary. But apart from that, I'm going to argue that actually it's got nothing to do with Mary. Um, it's just interpreted that way. Um, if it, if the statement had simply said Jesus Christ, then you wouldn't have looked into it any further. Um, 
But the peculiarity in Islam is they refer to Jesus as Isa. Now, recently, Dr. Ahmed Al Jalad um, has brought out some information about the early Arabic inscriptions using the word Isa. And what he's found is that prior to Christianity, so going way back, they used that as an Arabic name. And what does the Arabic name? So this is before Christianity, there was a, a name Isa. And what it meant was someone who pays or a redeemer. So he argues that when they were choosing the name Isa in some circles within um, um, Arabic speakers, now some didn't use this, but some did, they thought that it was appropriate to use an, an Arabic equivalent, which is Isa, because Jesus is a redeemer, so it made sense. Unfortunately, the Quranic writers um, mustn't have been aware of that meaning of redeemer because it denies, at least in the Arabic, that Jesus was crucified. So that's a bit of an irony there. So what is this about? Is it saying that Mary is part of the, of the Trinity or not? So um, first of all, where we where um, we need to go with this is we need to put it into its proper context. If we take that as delivered to an Arabian audience in Mecca in the Hijaz, it makes no sense. Christians have never included Mary in the Trinity, and that seems like the only way we can interpret it. But if we set it inside a Syria context, anywhere in the Fertile Crescent, then a totally different meaning can be given to it. And this is the w where I'm going with this. I'm going to put it into a Syria context and see, um, does that make sense in that context? Is there another meaning to it? So there is a precedent in the Syriac culture prior to Islam for calling the Holy Spirit a mother. This was new to me. Um, I found it in a Gnostic text, the Acts of Thomas, and I quote, We glorify and praise thee and thine invisible father and thine Holy Spirit, the mother of all creation. Now, in Aramaic, Holy Spirit, Ruah, is feminine. So it made sense for Aramaic speakers to refer to the Holy Spirit as feminine and obviously god the father is masculine so it's kind of like they're viewed as um father and mother within the trinity and then jesus of course is the son and the holy family jesus mary and joseph are kind of like a mirror reflection of the trinity then so this is um exclusive to syriac speakers outside of this uh religious context um uh, let's for say Latin Christians, for example, they would have referred to the Holy Spirit exclusively as masculine, simply because the in Latin, the grammatically, it would have been masculine. So it would have met, met any sense among Latin Christians to refer to the Holy Spirit as masculine. And that is the tradition that has basically dominated throughout Christendom ever since. But it still exists among Syriac speakers. I found this, as I said, in the Acts of Thomas, and I spoke to Odin Lafontaine, and he directed me to Edward Marie Gallaise's work, Le Messie et son prophète. Um, and to my amazement, he also made the same link, but he also found other sources from the Syriac world. Um, I've taken his, um, his book and I've translated it from French with a little bit of help from Google. But my French is not too bad, um, so I think the translation is pretty good, if I do say so myself. So this is one passage here. Um, he says, in relation to Mary, the study of the Quranic text presents another surprise. The verse 5, 116 gives the impression of placing Mary in the Trinity that Christians profess. He goes on to say that this would never hold water if this um, accusation was said to Christians. Christians would have laughed any Muslims out of court with this suggestion because nowhere do Christians believe Mary is one of the Trinity. Um, so he gives this translation to the passage that I've already referred to. But what is really happening is the Quran is mocking Christians for confusing an emanation of God with separate deities. So to make it clear, um, the idea of the Holy Spirit and Jesus, or God the Son, has come from God the Father. No problem with that. What the Quranic author is, is against or mocking 
is the idea that these each each of these persons are treated as if they are separate gods. That's what the issue is. Um, so a Christian could make the same argument as he is making. Um, so it's not against the Trinity. So here's what Galais has to say. It is this way of speaking of the Trinity still current among the Chaldeans that the author of verse 5, 116 mocks, which ancient Muslim commentators had indeed understood. The mockery is clever. The author does not make Jesus deny the fact that the spirit is his mother. He makes him deny that he himself and the spirit are a second and a third co-god, the latter having to be simply an emanation of God. In short, Christians are people who confuse and mix everything. Does that make sense? So he, he's basically um, saying that the, the Quranic author is mocking those Christians who are foolish enough to, to treat the Trinity as separate, three separate gods. That's what's really going on. Okay. The polemic here in the chapter 5, verse 116 is, are you saying that these are separate gods or are you really when you know that they should be all one God? That's it. That's it in a nutshell. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's going to make more sense as we go a little bit further, but that's it in a nutshell. So the Quran is not attacking the idea of the Trinity, but attacking those who propose tritheism as their understanding of the Trinity, the idea that there are three separate gods. So I'm going to give you a little bit more uh, information about this and notice the the context in terms of geography and in terms of the the timeline the chronology of this is very interesting because the place and the time is early seventh century late sixth century so it's very interesting indeed okay so this was usually so tritheism was usually little more than a hostile label applied to those who emphasized the individuality of each hypostasis or divine person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, over the unity of the Trinity as a whole. So all the accusation is about overemphasizing the individuality over the unity. That's all the issue is. The accusation was especially popular between the third and seventh centuries AD. John Philoponus, who died in 570, so same year, funny enough, that Muhammad was supposed to have been born, he and his followers, Eugenius and Conan of Tarsus, taught that the common nature of the Trinity is an abstraction, so that while the three persons are consubstantial, they are distinct in their properties. Their view was an attempt to reconcile Aristotle with Christianity. This view, which was defended by Patriarch Peter III of Antioch, was condemned as Tritheism at a synod in Alexandria in 616. Notice the timing. And notice where the locations are. It's way up in the north, Alexandria and Antioch. Okay, so let's put it in, in terms of a map. So the Christians around Antioch there, which are in the top uh, rectangle, they they liked the Tritheism idea. They didn't believe that the, the, the three persons of the Trinity were actually separate gods, but they did like the idea that they had a very distinctive attributes whereas the patriarch of alexandria down in egypt as you can see said they were going too far they were treating the trinity as three separate gods so this was a lively topic in the early part of the seventh century in fact there was a synod in 616 i would argue this is the context for the passage in the quran okay so there it, it, he's now the the Christians in that area would still have held to those views, regardless of that synod in 616. So the author is basically mocking those Christians in that area, which is probably trying to, it might suggest that the target audience for this chronic passage might be Christians, Arabic Christians, who they are trying to persuade to become part of this movement that Odin LaFontaine refers to as the Judeo-Nazarenes. So Jay, do you want to um, comment on that? Um, this is fascinating because what you're doing, you're putting it into a historical context when this really was a problem. I didn't know that. This is new for me, and I'm sure for many of those viewing us, that this was a problem between the Alexandrian church 
and the Antioch church, one of which was the Antioch in this case would have been tritheistic, not really tritheistic, but that's the way they came across because of this emphasis of the separateness of the Godhead. Whereas the Alexandrians were trying to say, no, be careful. You are worshiping the, to the, the to them as separate from God. And that's why this would be, this would fit into that context very clearly in that historical time at those historical places which are further north again it fits in with what we have been saying all the way along these are all disputes that are going on in this this case the seventh century 616 is the early seventh century and yet it's happening not down in mecca medina where there are no christians we know that there are no christians or jews in mecca medina not that early they're all from tabuk on north well syria is exactly the place where this is happening antioch would make sense for because that's yeah. where the the tri tritheistic viewpoint was uh, was very popular. So the, the if you imagine a line between Alexander and Antioch, that region is is where the Christians are that this passage is addressing. He's yeah. basically arguing, come and join our group. Don't be like the the people up in Antioch, those silly people. Be more like the Alexander people. You know, we have the sensible point of view on the Trinity. So this is actually explosive stuff because it's the Quran is not actually anti-Trinitarian in its when you properly understand the context. And obviously the, the these passages came at a time when Islam was very different. In fact, Islam really didn't exist when this passage had been written initially. And the fact that it becomes 616, that means this is long before the Quran is starts even to be introduced by Abdan Malik, who doesn't come till 691. Yeah. Uh, uh, creating Quranic references like chapter four, verse 171, that is on the Dome of the Rock or on the coins. So that yeah. we're talking about, we're talking about, oh, a good 80 years, maybe 70 years earlier that this was a discussion that was going on. That makes yeah. sense now why Abdul Malik jumps into this discussion and attacks both groups. Yeah, it's like, it's kind of like, do you remember like Martin Luther put his thesis on the church door? Yeah. It's like, it's these these passages are part of a debate and people wrote their ideas down on paper and, and people argued about it and then they said no 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 it's this and someone else says no it's that so this is what's going on now centuries later people are looking at the text and they have no context and they're misinterpreting what they're reading so that's what's I could suggest is going on here. And just for people, just so they were, this is nothing new. This has not come out ex nihilo. This has been coming from the fourth century when Athanasius argued against Arian, the Arians, uh, in the fourth century at the Council of Nicaea over this very point. Yeah. So this is nothing new. This fourth century, we're now 200 years later or 300 years later now, we're in the seventh century. And this is still a carryover from that which had happened earlier. This all fits to the historical context. What Islam does with this is, uh, as Abdul Malik, who initiates that, he initiates this idea, let's let's throw away the Trinity completely. Jesus is nothing more than a man. That's uh, then introduced at the end of this century, uh, the end of the 7th century. And you know what's interesting is that, as we'll see later, there are very famous Muslim um, scholars who actually confirm this interpretation the idea that the holy spirit has been referred to as mother here so okay. the fact that they the fact that they do also confirms that the quran must have been written up in the north because it makes no sense way down in the hijaz this, this has to be much further north Absolutely. really good. thank you god bless you all right let's continue on okay yeah okay so now we're going to the sources okay so i've given you one source for the syriac tradition of referring to the Holy Spirit as a mother. So here's another one from Mosul. Afrahate, um, he was born 280 to 345, or he lived from 280 to 345. He was a Syriac Christian, author of the, of the third century from the Persian Sasanian Empire, who composed a series of 23 expositions or homilies on points of Christian doctrine and practice. So if you imagine where that red rectangle, that would be perhaps his area of influence in terms of his ideas that probably would have lasted in that area for some time. Later, Syriac tradition places him at the head of Mar Mate Monastery near Mosul in what is now northern Iraq. So what has he got to say? 
So, Afrati the Persian, uh, who's actually a Syriac Christian, um, Edward Marie Gallais says, in fact, presenting the Holy Spirit as a mother was a usual way of speaking Aramaic traditions inherited from Judeo Christianity. Afrahate writes around 340 that the Christian who marries tends to forget his father and the Holy Spirit, his mother. So there's one from centuries before a clear reference to the Holy Spirit as a mother. Now, if we look at Oregon, who was from the second and third century, he was a Christian exegete and theologian who made copious use of the allegorical method in his commentaries and though later considered a heretic, laid the foundations of philosophical theology for the church. He was the first Christian to speak of three hypostases in the Trinity. Now, Christians believed that there were um, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit within the Trinity, but he was the one that basically came up with the Greek formula to try and explain it. OK, so he was born in Alexandria. He died in Caesarea. So his area, primary area of influence was in that red rectangle. So what does he say? So again, I'm quoting from Galais. This is what we can also read in the Gospel according to the Hebrews, of which Oregon reported the following words. So there was a, a, um, a document that was like another gospel that was in the possession of the Syriac speakers. Unfortunately, it was lost, but he gives us a quotation from it. The Savior said, a moment ago, my mother, who is the Holy Spirit, took me away by one of my hair and carried me to the great mountain of Tabor. And of which Jerome also transcribed two passages. The first of these is without doubt a parallel of the previous. In this gospel written according to the Hebrews, which is read by the Nazarenes, the Lord says, there is for a moment, my mother, the Holy Spirit lifted me up. So I think the key thing really is that we have early references to the Holy Spirit being referred to as my mother in Syriac sources. What's interesting is it's Jesus speaking here. Both of these yeah. quotes you had there are Jesus speaking and saying, my mother, I go, my mother, yeah. who is the Holy Spirit, my mother, the Holy Spirit lifted me up. That's Jesus being lifted up. So is he coming from Jesus' own lips, according to Oregon? Yeah. Um, and so, and we have this other one, we, a, again, from the, this gospel written in the Hebrew language that the Nazarenes read, we find this. It came to pass that as the Lord came up from the water, the whole fountain of the Holy Spirit came down and rested on him and said to him, my son, among all the prophets, I waited for you so that you come and that I can rest in you, for you are my rest, you are my firstborn son who reigned forever. So again, the, the suggestion, if the Holy Spirit is speaking, referring to Jesus as the son, then logically that would mean he's for sure the Holy Spirit is the mother in that context. Um, now we have Jerome. Now Jerome is mentioned by Galais simply as, as telling us about what Aragon said. So that's the context. So he's from the fifth century, essentially. He's famous for translating the Bible into Latin, which is known, which became known as the Vulgate lived and worked in Jerusalem, Bethlehem. So again, that's why I have that red, rec red rectangle to indicate the area of, of immediate influence. Um, so he, he has helped us quite a bit in terms of um, letting us know what Oregon had to say. Um, from Galais, this gospel according to the Hebrews, um, blah, 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 we know the reference book. Next to the Torah and the prophets, Groups forming the Messianist movement and whose most appropriate designation is that of Judeo-Nazarenes. This is who Galais believe are the group responsible for writing the Quran, the Judeo-Nazarenes. No copy of this gospel has come down to us and it is not known to date except through the quotations of some fathers of the church who unfortunately do not attach to it much importance. After quoting the same passage evoking Tabor in another commentary on the scriptures, Arjun simply added, it is a proof in their belief that the Holy Spirit is the mother of Christ. So again, I think that's pretty clear that the Syriac people in their Christian tradition believe that the Holy Spirit was a mother. Okay. Galais goes on to say, in fact, it is more a way of speaking than a belief. Oregon could have made the effort to explain that the word spirit is feminine in Hebrew, as well as in Aramaic, Ruah. 
However, since the Christian tradition specifies that Jesus was begotten under action of the Holy Spirit, it was inevitable that the title of mother would be attributed to the Holy Spirit. And so now we have what's referred to as the Odes of Solomon. The question is, is it a Christian text or a Gnostic text? To be complete, we can also point out that in certain literature, the Holy Spirit seems to be assimilated sometimes to a virgin, for example, in the Odes of Solomon. The virgin was a mother in so much tenderness, she was in labor, she begot a son, needed a midwife since she was invigorating. Like a male, she fathered in pleasure, she begat as an example. The idea is that the birth was not painful for her. Okay, now, according to Wikipedia, the, the majority consensus is that it is a Christian text. I'm just going to quote from this. This is nothing um, that is that would be disputed. Most um, people assume that it's a Christian text. The odes are generally dated to either the first century or the second century. The original language of the odes is thought to have been either Greek or Syriac, and the majority of scholars believe it to have been written by a Christian, likely a convert from the Essene community Christianity to Christianity because it contains multiple similarities to writings found in Qumran. Some have argued that the writer had even personally seen the Apostle John. A minority of scholars have suggested a Gnostic origin, but this theory is not widely supported. Now, Galais is one of the people who disagrees with the majority view, and he has got good arguments for why that is the case and why it's, it's actually a Gnostic text. He says, in fact, as the allusion to the male shows, it is a Gnostic text. All of the 42 poems of the work also have the primitive character typical of Judeo Gnosticism, close to the Johannine vocabulary and thought. Later Gnostic texts found at Nag Hammadi also mention a Judeo Gnostic trinity, father, mother, son. In one case, as in the other, it is a recovery of Judeo-Christian expressions with a view to make allegories of accession to the higher world. That's they have a Gnostic purpose, in other words. This diversion no longer reflects in any way what the Judeo-Christians say about the Trinity, and it is obviously foreign to the Messian, Messianist tradition echoed in the Quranic text. So. The key thing really is this is just another example of where the Holy Spirit is referred to as a mother, and this is from a Gnostic source. Um, now, what's fascinating is that we don't really have to make much of a case for this interpretation because Muslim commenters also say that this is about the Holy Spirit and not about Mary. So Galais um, mentions quite a list here. Commenters of the Quran, such as Al Tabari, Al Bidawi, Al Sama Shari, and Al Jalalain, and others indicate about this verse that it is about the Holy Spirit and not about the Virgin Mary. For them, no Christian has ever placed Mary among the Trinity. That is correct. So that's I think that's a good indicator that this interpretation is the correct one. The problem for Muslims is it obviously means that the Quran had to be written way up in the north not down in the Hijaz. And it makes perfect sense then that the Quran would be written in a script which is based on the um, the Aramaic script, as, as we've uh, mentioned prior to this. Um, so it all fits together like a glove, really. Um, so let's take stock of the audience indicated by Surah 5116. This is the last bit I'm going to look at. Just give you an idea of where the audience might be based on the fact that who would refer to the Holy Spirit as mother? So let's have a look. So we we saw Tritheism in Antioch and Tarsus. That's way up there. We saw that Afrati was from Mosul, which is there. We saw that Oregon was from Caesarea. So we can put him there. So we're starting to see a picture of the audience now that the Quran is addressing here. We have Jerome in Jerusalem and Bethlehem there we have odes of solomon which is believed to be from the Qumran, should be about there and then we have acts of thomas from edessa which is there oops so there we have it there is the likely audience for for that 
Sura 5, 116. Um, as you can see from the map, this is nowhere close to Mecca. It's about, a, a, I suppose, 600 to 800 miles, maybe, to Mecca. 600 to 1,200 miles, you're going up to Edessa. Yeah. So um, I think Muslims have got a major problem here explaining this one. Um, the authors have to be familiar with these Syriac traditions. So even though they speak Arab, Arabic, they must also speak Syriac. Um, I don't buy the idea that they, they were just um, oral traditions that they heard. I think these are so um, particular. I think you, you have to be able to read, to be able to pick up all of these nuances. Um, the audience have, have to be aware of these because the, the references here are very subtle. The, the, the Aramaic sources that the, the, the Quran is alluding to are never told. They're merely alluded to. So that means the audience must be very familiar with these stories. And in this context, Surah 5, 116, would have had to make sense to the audience. And where would it have made sense? Well, only among Christians who are familiar with this dispute in relation to the Christians of Antioch. And that must mean way up north where the, the red squares, red rectangles are referred to. So I'm just going to bring it back to you there, Jay. Well, fascinating. This is going to put a, a spanner into the works of lots of people, not only Muslims, who actually will be happy with what you have just found, but an awful lot of Christian apologists who are not going to be happy with what you've just found. So in some way, this is a double-edged sword. It, it does two things for us. And this is what I love what you, what, what you have done here. You, you're, hit, you're hitting two birds with one stone, and you're making two proofs. First and foremost, you're saying, be careful, be careful. Let's make sure what we've always said, good exegesis always goes back to what the author intended. That's good exegesis. Eisegesis is what we do when we want to put our own our own agenda onto a verse or a passage or even a, a scripture. And that's what we don't want to do. We don't want to do eisegesis. And you're saying, let's be careful here. Let's do proper exegesis. Let's see what this verse meant. It doesn't make sense. No Christian believes that Mary is part of the Trinity. So what's this, the mother, you and your mother, what's this got to do? How can Jesus be, how can God be, or, you know, how could God be? And we've said this in many debates. If this really comes from heaven, this comes from Allah, how could Allah make this mistake? This has always been a curiosity for us because I've heard references that people say, well, this is a group of Coloridians, that's a female cult that uh, that were part of the northern area uh, that uh, believed that Mary was part of the Trinity. Yes, but that's such a small group and had no significance. I'm not even sure. Some people say they didn't even exist in the 7th century when this would have all come together in these the debates. So what you have done is you said, okay, well, you're, again, not you, but Galez, and I want to give credit to Galez, mm -hmm. and also Odon Lafontaine, who has really put you on to Galez. Uh, this is a French scholar uh, from Belgium who we have, who Odon Lafontaine quotes quite often in his work. And what Galez has found is, let's go back to the seventh century. Let's go back even earlier. Let's go right back to the first century. Let's go back and see what this mother of Jesus is. Mother of Jesus, straightforward, seems to refer to Mary. Mm -hmm. Not, however, when you look at a lot of the writings. The writings is very clear that the Holy Spirit is a feminine, as the mother of Jesus. Jesus is quoted by Oregon as be as the Holy Spirit as his mother. So there's coming from Jesus' lips. And what you did, or what Gallas has done, and you're just taking it from him, is that he looks at sources that go back to Christian sources from Mosul, from Alexandria, Aphrodite. Uh, Ephrahate from Mosul, from Oregon, from Alexandria, uh, Jerome, who quotes Oregon. So it's not really him saying, it's his quotes of Oregon, but he, you won't quote him unless you agree with him. And then you're, uh, who all three re are very clear or that this is referring to the Holy Spirit, the mother of Jesus. You and your mother, you and the Holy Spirit is saying this. You quoted Gnostic sources, the Odes of Solomon, uh, which says much the same thing. Not that we are Gnostic, but we uh, we understand that in that context, the Gnostics did believe that. 
And then what's interesting is you quoted Muslim sources. Well done. So you've gone to Tabari and Al-Baidawi and Zamakshari and Jalalain. These are well-known. These are household names in Islamic theology. And they're all from the 9th and 10th. So now you're going from the 1st century all the way to the 10th century, quoting all these 10th and 11th century scholars who are very clear that this cannot be Mary the mother because nobody believes that Mary's part of the Trinity. No Christian that they're having discussions with, this is referring to the Holy Spirit. So Christians, Gnostics, and Muslims all believe this is referring to the Holy Spirit. And by saying that, you're saying this is really what this, this is what this verse is about. It's actually an attack against the the Antioch people who who are all tritheistic, who almost believe that Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are three separate gods within the tree. That's what's it attacking, which is what we would attack too. We would agree yeah. with that polemic. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are not three separate gods, and that's what it's attacking. It's the Alexandrian attack against the Antioch belief in tritheism. It's an internecine Christian debate that's happening as to what we mean by the trinity and you've got it wrong they are all three as one they are all three as one is what the alexandrians are trying to say so that is a very potent and it's a very ongoing strong debate that's happening the second all the way up until this time the sixth seventh and century especially the seventh century in 616 this is really strong in 616 this predates Islam because Islam has the same problem. Abdul Malik had the same problem on the Dome of the Rock, on the coins, as we've said earlier. He's attacking the triune nature of God, but he is attacking much more. Uh, he believes that Jesus never was God. So he does not agree with the Alexandrians in this case. That we'll put to the side right now. However, look, and this is what I'll, the second thing you've done. You have said, look on the map and see where these discussions are happening. To understand this verse, to understand what it's really saying, to understand what it, the polemic is, look and see where the polemic's taking place. Look where all these people are. Look and see where al afret Hati is. Well, he lives in Mosul. That is in Iraq. Look and see where Oregon. Well, he lives in Alexandria. That's in Egypt. Look and see where Jerome is. He is from Jerusalem. That's in Israel, way up farther north. Now, look where the Solomon, the Gnostics, that's way up even further in Edessa. And then look and see where Atabari, Baidawi, look where these guys are. They're all up in what is today, uh, what would be today would be Baghdad, mostly of them Baghdad. Both folks, that's all in the north, which makes sense. Because this would only make sense where this discussion would be happening. This discussion is only happening in the north. There were no Christians or Jews down in the south, down in uh, the Hejaz, uh, Mecca and Medina. We know that there were no Jews or Christians in the 7th century that far south because there's no water down there. If there's no water, no people, no people, no place, no place, no city, no city, no civilization, and no history. We've said that so many times, and the historical record supports that. Everything is happening in the north. This discussion is happening in the north. And if you're going to therefore understand what is happening in this discussion, look and see what they're saying. They're attacking the feminine form of the Holy Spirit as a separate god they're attacking that not that mary is the mother of god well this is huge this is going to have reverberations um i'd love to see what david wood and hatun tosh and uh sam solomon say with this uh, sam shamoon sorry i'd love to see what, how they take it because this also suggests that much of the traditions much and certainly the quran is all being formed much much further north and it's being formed in a context where the, only these debates could have happened, only these ideas were percolating, and only the view of the Holy Spirit as a feminine form would make sense, not south, much further north. I've never heard this before. This is all brand new to me. That's what I'm taking uh, taking home from it. God bless you. Thanks so much, Mel, for bringing this on board. Uh, let's see what people say. Back to you. Anything last you want to end off with? I think this is um, a great start to 2023, and I'm sure there's, <laughs> there's going to be an awful lot more to do with Aramaic and Syriac coming forward during the year. So Absolutely. I think this is going to be a great, great year. The more we scratch, the more we find. The more we find, the more they whine. The more they whine, the more we shine. Oh, how sublime. You've just now put another nail in the coffin that this could have happened. None of this material, these verse, this verse in particular, could not have made any sense down in Mecca and Medina. And we think it we think it is from Mecca and Medina where they just didn't understand the Trinity very well. No, this has nothing to do with the Trinity with Mary. This is to do with the Trinity with the Holy Spirit and the feminine form. 
Well done. God bless you. Thanks for that. Let's see how people comment. Let's see what kind of comeback. This is the first time I'm hearing it. Convince us. If we're if Mel's wrong or if Galez is wrong or Odin Lafontaine, if they are wrong, show us where they're wrong. Let's start this debate. What a way to start off the new year. This is going to be a good one. This Go ahead, Mel. Is there something more you just want to, before we end, end off, the, what, what, come back with me on and think. I want to invite the Syriac Christians who are watching this video to support what we're saying. Do you refer to the Holy Spirit as mother? I'd like to hear from you. Oh, very good. Okay, if there's anybody who knows Syriac, if you're from northern Syria, Damascus area, and you still believe, uh, are aware of the theology that is ongoing, even today in the 21st century, come back to us. Let us know if this really is something that is well known even today, not just historically, but as we speak. Thanks so much, Mel. What a way to start the new year. God bless you. And all those who are watching, let's hear from you. This is Jay and Mel, thousands of miles apart, over and out. Thank you.